Hey folks, Steve here with a special review video for you today. We are going to be looking at The Great Crisis of Frederick II, published by VUCA uh, Simulations, designed uh, by Tetsuya Nakamura. Uh, this is a game that I had done a unboxing video for uh, quite a while back, actually. Um, <clears throat> and my overall assessment was that the quality of the components looked great, but it, we needed to bet if the game was fun, if the game was good. Um, and I have now played the game um, three or four times now. Uh, one time, sort of a solo, trying out the system a little bit. And then three opposed games, um, where I got to play sort of both sides across those games and got a feel for them. So I felt like I could do a review. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look at that today. Um, and I will say, you know, there's a, there's a point in my unboxing video where I sort of made a statement to say that however you looked at this game, uh, you have to acknowledge that this is a sort of a reprint of a magazine game, and so the depth, the complexity, the chrome is couched very much uh, in that sort of lighter uh, treatment, as opposed to, say, something like, uh, oof, Heavy Box, Clash of Monarchs, uh, a game by GMT, which does the Seven Years' War, which is what this game covers, uh, in a little bit more deeper detail, um, a lot more Chrome, uh, but but being a multiplayer CVG uh, with a lot of nuanced rules, it, there's sort of a barrier to play that, where this is a two-player game um, that is uh, much lower complexity, and you can play it, um, you know, still a, several hours to, to play based on how uh, my wife and I play the game, uh, but it is a much lighter treatment, so much easier to get to the table uh, so, um, the real question was, you know, how does this game compare, uh, and does it fill the niche of a lower quality, or not lower quality, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, uh, lower intensity, um, game on the Seven Years' War. Uh, and again, I had referenced back in that unboxing video that there was a game called Frederick's Gamble, uh, that was going to be a four-player, lighter CDG from GMT that ended up um, being canceled because the designer couldn't keep working on it, and I felt the loss of that game deeply, and so the question uh, that I really had for this game was, could it fill the same niche enough that um, it earned its place on my game shelf to keep, and, and am I happy with it? So, uh, if you'd like the answer to that question, you'll want to head to the end of this video, uh, where I go over uh, my thoughts, the actual, um, uh, all the thoughts I have on the game itself, I will have a transition here in the video that will point you to the timestamp that you can skip to to get to the end analysis and thoughts that I have on the game. Um, but we'll do this like my reviews in the past where uh, I will spend a decent amount of time talking about the game mechanics, showing off the components a little more closely so you get a better idea of what the game plays like uh, and what you're buying uh, with your money. And I will say that, you know, this is... Uh, in terms of components, like I said in my unboxing video, components are really pretty stellar um, and a very deluxe treatment for a magazine game. So the game, you can kind of look at it and say, well, I could see how this used to be a, a magazine game. Um, they really put a lot of production value into this, so uh, while it might be more expensive than uh, a magazine game, as a magazine game would be, for instance, um, you're getting a lot of quality. Uh, for what you're purchasing, it seems like, and and we'll talk into uh, talk about that a little more closely here when we we zoom in to the game components in the map. So yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at it, guys, and let's talk about the game again. If you want to skip to the end, we'll show you the timestamp for that. Okay, we're going to look at the game mechanics and the components of the game a little more closely here. As I mentioned, uh, the game is certainly a deluxe treatment. Um, so even just looking at the box, uh, the, the box it actually has kind of a grain to it um, and is thick and sturdy. Um, I mean, it's, you know, a uh, standard box size, but the actual components uh, are, are nice. Uh, and when you look at what's inside, um, you have a sort of... Uh, insert that kind of helps keeps, thing, keeps things organized. There's not so much stuff in the game that you can't fit it all back in very easily. Um, it does that quite well. And it comes with four dice, and, and I have a lot of counters here in baggies. I have a few out for demonstration purposes for the video. 
uh, but the box is in good shape. The, uh, the rule book uh, is sort of glossy paper, two column format with pictures and examples, um, and pretty straightforward stuff. The rules um, are across 14, 15 pages, the back page showing sort of a sequence of play uh, and procedures. And I'll say uh, that the game does not have a player aid chart. Now, uh, I could see some instances where that might have been nice to have, um, but the rules are not so complex that you really feel the absence of one, but it is odd, you kind of feel like you should have one and you don't, I don't know, it's sort of a weird thing you get used to. Now the errata and the clarifications that exist um, for the game fit on one sheet of paper here, and I have mine printed out as, as the errata. Now, some people complain that there's some errata. It is really straightforward errata. It is nothing, you know, like there's some clarifications here that kind of help explain certain things that folks had questions on, but the actual errata itself is very straightforward. Uh, and I found that in playing the game, um, you know, the errata and the clarifications kind of fit in with like common sense stuff that if I didn't have that sheet and I was reading the rules, I would kind of make a leap um, on how to interpret that. And, and really pretty pretty happy with the, the corrections that were made in the errata. So nothing too crazy there um, or, or bad. I, I will say that the rules themselves um, are pretty easy to follow. Uh, and there's nothing too crazy uh, there. Um, the one thing that you will note if you're used to games around this time period is that a lot of games will have a mechanic for interception uh, or avoiding combat, and you really don't have that. Um, you can avoid combat. There's sort of a, a structured way to do it, but it's sort of integrated with some other game mechanics that we'll talk about. So um, movement's just a little bit different than, than you might expect if, if, if this were a card-driven game. Now, there are cards but they are not used in a card-driven way. It's more like a card-assisted game. And you can see you've got these cards. These are the Austrian action cards, and then those black ones over there are the Prussian action cards. Um, and again, you can see, I mean, it just the, the artistry in the components is out of this world. I mean, it's really, really neat uh, components. Really enjoy that. Um, speaking more about the components, the map is... Uh, uh, mounted, mounted map board, you can see um, there's no, the back, it has a sort of like a wallpaper to it, which is kind of interesting, it's not just blank, which is surprising, uh, but this is the map itself, obviously, and, and it looks quite nice, it's is it it's very aesthetically pleasing, uh, it is point-to-point -point movement, and you can kind of see, you know, black is Prussian, uh, sort of the gold is Holy Roman Empire and, and Austria, uh, you have Hanover in red, uh, and then there's some German, or I'm not, sorry, not German, Russian stuff way up here um, that is kind of off map and the Russians will enter the game uh, eventually. Um, oh, and, and of course France down here on the bottom left. Um, the way uh, that the game works is that you're obviously going to have uh, uh, stacks of units on the board. They're going to move around the map and you will end up in combat. Um, and, you know, we'll sort of examine the sequence of play, but just so folks understand how combat works, is that you are basically operating on a firepower system. Um, so your combat strength of your army is predominantly based on the number of units that you have, but leaders have an enhancing factor on how well your units perform. So basically it's a bucket of dice system, and you will roll dice according to uh, how many units you have. So how the leader system works, and I'm going to zoom in here on my example, uh, I'm going to, of course, fight with the camera a little bit, but, okay. So let's say you've got this huge stack here, and, and honestly, this is a stack that is conceivable in the game. Um, you can actually bring different stacks of units together before combat occurs, uh, which um, allows you, if you have a lot of action points, which we'll talk about here shortly, um, you can actually concentrate a lot of forces and, and have a big battle, and, and the more forces you have, the more likely you, you will be to win. Now, the way that this works is that the defender gets to roll first, so that's sort of you know a defender advantage, something that you would expect to see in games like this. So they will roll dice, and then the attacker will roll dice, and it'll sort of go back and forth. But that first die roll for the defender is really important, because any hits that they take uh, or inflict upon the enemy will reduce their ability to deal damage back. So there is a tremendous advantage in being the defender there, particularly if you're using Frederick, that leader there. 
So you can see I have several units uh, here stacked. Basically the way it works is for each unit you get a die to roll for combat. Um, now if your unit takes a hit, it flips to a disordered side, in which case it does not get a die to roll for combat. Um, and basically you have to take hits so that every unit in your stack or in the combat is flipped and disordered before you actually eliminate a unit. Units that are disordered can later be rallied and brought back to full strength and thus getting the dice back for them. Um, but having a heavily disordered army is really dangerous because they can't defend themselves well and the more units you lose, uh, the way the economy of the game works, it's just very difficult to get a lot of units back on the board uh, some of the time. So, so really you'll see armies start to wear down. Um, but here, it's quite a big army, right? You say, we're, we're doing pretty good. The interesting thing is, leaders themselves are a unit. It's not just the general, it's the general and some allotment of units. So if we were rolling dice, we would be rolling 4, 8, uh, 12, 14 dice, which is pretty strong. Um, the important thing is how the leaders take effect into this calculation. So if we look, and I'm going to zoom in, I'm sorry for shaky cam. Uh, if we look more closely at the leaders, you can see uh, Frederick in the upper left there has a... Uh, it might be a little hard to see with the focus, I apologize. Uh, he has a 3 rating in the yellow box and a 8 rating in the sort of gray box. The uh, yellow box is for combat ratings, so if they're really good in combat, uh, that's their tactical rating, and the uh, other number is sort of their seniority slash command limit rating. So what this basically means is that uh, Frederick has a combat bo bonus of 3, and he can apply that to 8 units, one of those units being himself, basically. Um, so the way this works is you are going to roll a die, uh, and you're going to add the tactical bonus to your die roll. You hit on a 6. So, ordinarily, if you didn't have any units with a command bonus or units by themselves, they could fight, and you would roll dice, and what you would need to do is roll a 6 to cause a hit. For Frederick, you had a 3. So you can imagine if you roll a 3, 4, 5, or a 6, now that is a hit. And that's 66% chance on a 1d6 to hit. That's incredibly powerful, particularly on defense. You can lay waste to an attacker before they ever have a real chance to attack you. Uh, that's really important. But, again, the limit is on eight units, so these eight units in the first uh, li two lines there of units would have that bonus. Then you have uh, the leader also here, um, which is what? Think. He has a tactics bonus of one and a command rating of four. What that means is he can command four units, and they get a plus one to their die roll. So himself and these other three units in this stack, um, all in the same combat, would be rolling and they would hit on a 5 or a 6, so a 33% chance of hitting. And then finally you have these two other units uh, in the stack that aren't covered by any particular general's bonus, so you're just going to roll those dice, the two dice for those two units, and they'll only hit on a 6. And that's the basic combat mechanism for the game, is that you're looking to roll 6s, and in field battles, uh, your leaders will provide a bonus. Um, and again, sometimes um, you will find yourself attacking with a crappy leader. You'll be attacking with units that do not get covered by a leader bonus in excess of your leader's ability. Um, and what you're going to end up doing is rolling all of those dice separately. So you might say, like, okay, I'm going to roll uh, my... Frederick dice, my eight dice with a plus three. Here we go. Roll them. Count the hits. Uh, then I'm going to roll the four dice for Fink and his four units. So roll those four dice. Add one to each one. Record how many hits you get. Uh, and all the way through. And, you know, you, you do get into a mode of rolling lots of dice and seeing what happens. But that is sort of, you know, the way the game is structured. Now, what's really important in all of this is that, you know, if you're looking to say, how do I win the game? Uh, the game is tracked by resources. So uh, on the map, you have several spaces that are resource hexes. Uh, predominantly, they are going to be resource forts. So you can see uh, forts with a big starburst, uh, like Magdeburg, uh, like Hamburg, are resource forts. So they are not only uh, really good forts that are strong, uh, stronger than even a regular fort, like... Uh, that space right there, 
Um, they're, they're better in general and that they count as a resource. Berlin is a special space that is not a fort but is still a resource, and I believe that's the only one uh, on the map that acts that way. There are off-map resources, so there's one for Sweden, and then uh, Russia actually has four. So, you know, you, only the Russians can be in that off-map box, only the Swedes can be in that off-map box, and the British have their own as well with three, where other units from other nations can't go to those boxes, but um, those factions perpetually have a certain number of resources. Uh, you track resources on the game uh, uh, game charts uh, that are off to the side of the map over, over here. Um, and basically, the way the game is structured is if the Prussians get 16 resource hexes, which you can kind of see as victory points, they will win the game. And if they are brought too low, around 8 or 9, depending on who controls Berlin, then the Austrians will win, basically. And, and that's really how the game is couched. It's Prussia versus Austria, regardless of the allies that are involved in the war. Um, so uh, you are going to be fighting over those resources, and uh, the game is sort of structured with some level of history where the Russians will eventually switch sides, but that is somewhat random, but it is towards the tail end of the game. When that happens, the Russian resources switch from the Austrian player to the Prussian player. Uh, and the way sort of the math works out on who's controlling what resources, and you can see there's resources over in Hanover. There are resources uh, in France. There are resources in the Holy Roman Empire regions, resources all throughout Austrian territory, that if the Prussians can gain control of uh, Saxony here, if they can take hold of Saxony, which is sort of a war aim that they had, take take control of those, retain control of those, and, and fight defensively enough that they can get the Russians to switch sides, they can win the game just by doing that. And so the tempo of the game basically becomes the Prussians are on offense early to seize some territory, and then they're on the strategic defensive, fending off the multiple attack avenues of Austria and her allies. The Austrians coming from sort of the south over here, the French uh, coming from the southwest eventually and fighting against the British forces, uh, the Swedes from the north a little bit here, and then uh, the Russians, while they're an Austrian ally for most of the game, uh, in the east as they march past and take Königsberg and, and get down into here. So there's a lot uh, there in terms of managing the avenues of how you're getting into places. And there are choke point spaces here that make it uh, difficult to um, expand very fast. And one of the restrictions when it comes to movement and activation is if you enter an enemy space, you can take control of it, but you have to stop moving. So there's not going to be a case where you can do um, these huge maneuvers up and down all these spaces uh, without sort of investing the time in it. And, and I will get to, in terms of strategy, um, a little bit in why that really matters. Because, again, you, you can move quickly through territory you already control, but when it comes to entering enemy territory, it, it is slower. You can't just make these magical advancements. So the tempo of the game is really balanced around that, and again, the need for the Prussian to play a very, uh, uh, we'll say, active defense, especially with Frederick, who is really great on defense and can move around, you know, the Prussians can move around a lot, so as the Prussian player, you're really balancing uh, his ability to move around the map quickly and address different avenues of attack, whereas the Austrian, you're really trying to overstress the Prussians so that even if they're defending, you're just wearing them out to the point where you make critical breakthroughs and take areas like Berlin, which can have a dramatic shift on the game. The resource hexes also are the source of lines of communication, so there is a supply system, and you can find yourself isolated. So we'll talk a little bit about that here more in a minute. Um, let's see, let me, uh, let me take a look at the turn sequence, and let's kind of talk through the real flow of the game. But I wanted to talk about how battles occur and your objectives out of the gate, so you at least, you know, if you don't watch this whole video, you at least understand how combat works and what you're trying to achieve. That's sort of the, uh, an important thing here. Okay, so the uh, turns are pretty straightforward in the game. They really come down to uh, a chit draw or chit pull system. And I'm going to show on screen a few critical game markers so you kind of understand uh, what we're looking at. So um, basically, 
at the start of each turn, you're going to load a cup with a certain number of action chits, the recipe for which is really straightforward. Basically, uh, certain action chits for certain factions, which are treated separately, like the French, like the Russians, will enter the cup on certain turns, but you start with basically two Prussian, two Austrian chits, and then throughout some of the early turns, you will eventually add the British chits, you will add French chits, and, and the Russian chits. What will happen is when you uh, begin the game, there's usually a side that has initiative, or you will determine initiative, uh, and that person will basically get to start the turn with a, with a chit, um, and you'll then roll a die to determine how many action points that that uh, faction has. The Prussians get an automatic plus two, so the Prussians just sort of have extra mobility, which is nice. Um, but you'll put a little marker on the game track, uh, one of the game tracks, to denote how many action points you rolled. And then you will spend those action points uh, until you reach zero, and then that activation is done. Then another chit is pulled from the cup. You could have one player's chits all come out before the other player even has a chance to go. And in fact, the turn will end whenever you draw a turn end chit. And in fact, uh, very often times we would draw the turn end chit first, and the turn would just be done. Like it would just, it would, we'd finish the turn and move on um, just like that. And that is feasible. That's in the rules. It's supposed to happen that way. And I'll kind of talk to why that is okay. Um, but yes, in some turns you simply have a case where one side gets to go and then the turn end marker comes up uh, as its own action chip and the other side didn't get to go at all. They just don't get to go. Um, and that's a, it's a very tough thing. And, 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 and of course there's chances you're going to draw the turn end shit as the very last shit. So it's a much longer turn than, than you think it will be. Um, and it's kind of an interesting way to, to deal with that. Um, but basically with your action points, uh, you are able to move units around. Um, and, and basically up to eight combat units can move together for an action point, uh, basically like one space. Um, and uh, you, you might say there's a restriction on that. And you know, that, or that feels very restrictive. The reality is it, it, it is. Um, uh, so, so what you gotta have, what, what you really are gonna be keeping in mind is, are you going to move a lot of units, or a lot of stacks, I should say, um, one space, or maybe you're gonna move one stack very far. And the way that the front lines kind of shift in this game might mean that you don't have nearly as many action points as you need to do what you want to do, or you have an overabundance and there's just not as much that you really want to do or you, that you can do. So you can spend points to, to rally units. So basically, one action point will restore one unit from its disordered side to its full side, in which case you'll then place a recovered marker on it. Units that rally or become recovered uh, cannot move in that same... Uh, chit activation. So you could find after a pretty major battle your main army's pretty banged up even if you roll very high for your next activation with a lot of action points you may be spending a lot of it just getting those guys back in good order to fight the next critical battle. Um, so you'll uh, move units around when they enter a space that is enemy controlled they have to stop moving. So you know ideally and here's the little control chits um, you need to create good lines of control uh, to make it easier to work your way around the map. And in fact, um, right here on, on uh, what I'm showing here, there's an important sort of pathway that the Prussian player really cares about. So in the beginning of the game, the Prussian player is going to be working to take Leipzig and Dresden right there. But their ally, who is Britain, who has the red markers, there, there is a connection further north that you can see here. You can go from Berlin... Magdeburg, and so on up through here, but it's faster if you go through here. Now, one of the tricks is that Erfurt is actually controlled by the Holy Roman Empire, which is an Austrian faction. But early in the game, if you park a unit here with one of your activations, they will take control of that space at the end of your activation, and then on future activations, you can sail right on through here to get to the west. Um, but you, you, know, you couldn't simply... Uh, go from here to here to here right away. You have to stop, take control of that province or that, that city area, uh, town area of Erfurt, and then in the future be able to move far. So the, there's sort of this, um, the more territory that you can capture, 
the easier it'll be to sort of retain it because someone looking to take it back or to you know uh, penetrate your regions it won't happen super fast so there's always a little bit of time a little bit of opportunity to salvage a situation uh, but can oftentimes get uh, you know pretty dicey pretty quickly uh, and that's where the whole isolation bits of uh, the game are so um, there's an element of uh, Uh, there's an element of maneuver still in the game, even though there's not interception uh, and that sort of gameplay mechanic where you're sort of like, there's a chance that you move into the space before the enemy. That doesn't happen. Um, but because you can still kind of move around, uh, there is the potential to cut guys out of supply. Um, and you can even have armies that have cut each other out of supply and have them both be out of supply, attacking and besieging territory. In fact, the the example of play in the rule book shows some of how that works but units that are isolated get the little isolated marker at the beginning of every chit draw uh, when you add, do perform an activation you check supply so um, if you are going to end up you know someone could cut you out of supply and it'll be adjudicated as such very quickly um, and when you're isolated units are going to roll half as many dice as they would normally roll in combat and then there's the potential that during a uh, winter turn that they will have winter depletion, which is like, you know, it's attrition basically, and you're going to cause more losses. I found that isolating units uh, can be very important to overcoming your enemy, and even more so, creating a situation where you are totally surrounding an army so that if they lose a battle and have to retreat, um, they're going to be automatically eliminated. And, and there's a case where, like, if your army becomes so depleted that you don't roll any dice, you kind of have to retreat or, or you're just going to be destroyed anyway. Um, <laughs> and there's nothing that can be done about it. So there were times where I completely destroyed French armies using the British by just getting them outmaneuvered on the game map a little bit over in, in these regions where they, they penetrated very deep into my territory, but I swung around and they couldn't get anywhere and I wiped out like eight French units because I did outperform them in battle uh, and they had nowhere to go. So while the game sort of has this staggered movement to it, uh, you still have pretty good opportunities to surround armies and catch them off guard and, and destroy them or put them in untenable positions. A lot of that has to do with the chip pull. So you don't really know when you're going to get that opportunity to, just like an in interception and other point-to-point -point movement games. Um, there's still some chance to it, but you can definitely, you know, put yourself too far out on a limb, too, where, like, you can move in a position, but you really need the next shit to be another one of yours so that you can, you know, close the lid and, and trap them when, nope, they get their shit and they can sort of outmaneuver you, you know, in turn, right? So there's elements of that that come into play that you have to watch out for. Now, a big element that still has to be considered as you're playing the game is that, uh, fort spaces, even regular forts like this, and, and the resource forts, uh, do have to be sieged if there are friendly, you know, or, you know, enemy units in them. So uh, if you, if nobody was occupying uh, Leipzig and, and Frederick moved into this space, he would capture it at the end of his activation, right? He's entered an enemy space, he will capture it if there's no enemy there, even if it's a fort. But if there's at least even one unit, even a depleted unit, then uh, they will have to besiege it. And, I, and I'll tell you that um, even one unit in a, in a fort can be uh, a problem because the siege rules are a little bit different. So in a siege battle, uh, the attacking army does not get any leader bonuses. So there you're rolling just sixes. And I tell you, it's so frustrating. If you roll eight dice and you just can't get a six to save your life, um, sieges can actually take a little while to, to successfully close out. And very critically, um, the defender gets some bonuses. So there are... Um, it's going to be hard to get the focus right on these. Um, but basically, if you're in a regular fort, one unit max can sit inside the fort itself, uh, and it gets a plus one die roll bonus in addition to any leader bonuses. So if you are willing to put a leader in danger, 
and put him in the fort or have him be the unit that's in the fort, there will be an additional plus, right? A resource fort can hold two units and get a plus two. So you can almost imagine a situation where, like, if Frederick were, for some reason, in a resource fort being besieged, he would add, you know, as a defender in the fort battle, he would add two for the resource fort and then three uh, for his tactics rating, which basically means every die roll uh, rolled will inflict damage on the besieger. So uh, sieging is definitely something that you have to invest in, and while you're doing that, your army is stationary, and your opponent may be looking for ways to outflank you and sort of trap you in a besieged situation. Um, and I do like that aspect of gameplay where, you know, truly, if you're dealing with the Silesian region, there's a whole network of forts that you're trying to maneuver around. You're trying to sneak your way uh, into the backfield of Austria if you can, but you know, there's a whole blank spot here where there's not really any connections, so your your avenues of advance are still relatively limited. And in fact, if you look at the spaces from here uh, at Aachen all the way to the east to the, the uh, Breslau resource fort, you can actually get to a place where, like, the, the lines are, like, the British... And the Prussians are right here above that line, and then the Austrians are below this line, and you're sort of just fighting along this line, trying to find a way to get past the other. Um, but the Prussian player still has to worry about the Russians coming from the east. Um, okay, so when uh, you, you, just to, to reiterate on how the game works, you're going to draw the action shit, you're going to roll the dice to see how many action points you have, you're going to use those points to move units, um, or rally units, or activate a unit stack uh, that is besieging a fort to activate it for fort combat, so it's sort of like activating a siege for another try. Um, and then at the end of uh, any battles that you're fighting at that point, and again, you complete all movement before battle, so you can aggregate forces before the battle is conducted. You're going to then remove any recovery markers that you have. Uh, you're going to mark control. And then you're going to check to see if you may draw any tactics cards. So we haven't talked about the tactics cards, but each player has their own deck. So the way it works is if you defeat, uh, uh, I believe it's if you defeat an army, um, if you take a fort hex, doesn't matter what kind of fort, even a regular fort, um, you will potentially get a tactics card. And in fact, that's one of the interesting economical parts of the game. So uh, usually when the turn ends, or, or rather you get to a winter turn at the end of, uh, basically the, the game is set up in years, each year is six turns, and the sixth turn of each year is a winter turn. Um, depending on how many resource hexes you get, you're going to get a certain number of tactics cards just to have them. That's sort of like your economic uh, uh, accrual from taking these resource hexes. But in the middle of those turns, across those six turns, you can still get tactics cards by succeeding in taking those forts and winning certain combats. Um, and it's really important that you manage your hand because um, if you're finding yourself without cards and your opponent has cards, they're going to be at a tremendous advantage against you. Now, the way that these cards work is that they do different things. Uh, if you have a card, and you can see they're, they're very basic, they do have numbers on them. <clears throat> Uh, these correlate to a leader's combat rating. So if there's a yellow box on them, they are combat cards. You can only use it if your leader in the combat, uh, your, your primary leader, has that number. So to use wetlands, you need to have a leader with a 2 tactics rating. And then you'll get uh, this effect in that battle. So the enemy's phase, you're going to play this uh, in an enemy's phase at the start of a battle. Limit the enemy's commander bonus to plus one. So this is an Austrian card. You would have to have a pretty good leader. Uh, maybe you're fighting Frederick and, and he's attacking you. Um, and you're going to play Wetlands and that will reduce Frederick's bonus from three to one. So that's a really great way to sort of limit the Prussians' natural advantages. Um, but you may only have so many cards and you may only have, um, you know, you might not have a good leader to do it. But there's other ones like High Ground... Uh, and in fact, there's a very critical card in here, which is the Cavalry Charge. Now, there's some Cavalry Charge cards that need a 2-liter. Some of them require a 1-liter. You can see your opponent has, uh, you know, you play this when they've declared a retreat, or if they've done a Cavalry Charge themselves. 
Um, this either prevents an enemy retreat or, or counters a cavalry charge. So if you say, I'm going to retreat, somebody might, you know, your opponent's going to play cavalry charge to keep you from retreating. Or, you know, they're going to play this card uh, and you play your own cavalry charge to counter it so that you can retreat. Uh, and basically what will happen is if they, if they manage to play this on you and you can't counter it, you don't get to retreat and you don't even get to fire back. And so this is a critical card where uh, if you're not careful and you don't have a cavalry charge of your own, you could be uh, royally screwed where you can't retreat and then the enemy gets another crack at your units and you can have some pretty nasty devastation happen. So there is an element of card management like, oh, I probably want to sit on a cavalry charge just in case, or if I have multiple cavalry charges, then I feel like I can probably use one against my opponent if I don't think he can do it. Uh, you have High Ground, which nullifies cards like Surprise Attack or Cavalry Charge, so sometimes you might play this uh, as insurance. There are other cards that happen more uh, on the strategic level, so you can play this to add more activation points to your roll, so if the French really need to do something, you roll their activation die and you only roll a 1, you can play this to make it plus 2 so they have 3 action points. This can actually be super important uh, in the game. To, to get some of those slow-moving factions off their butts. Um, and you'll find, as the Austrian player, uh, that um, you really need to manage how often and how far the Russians and the French can go. Uh, because the French and the Russian chits don't come up very often, there's only one of them in the cup at any time, uh, those cards can be very important. If you're only rolling a 1 and the, and the Russians can only move one space, you know, it takes them a long time to get from their holding box to Königsberg, through here all the way to really threaten Berlin like they did historically. That is sort of part of the baked-in timer in the game. Um, certain chits don't come up as often. The turn can end without those chits coming up at all. So when the French and the Russians go, you really want it to count as much as possible. Um, and that just kind of gets into the way that the game goes. Again, there, there's random, randomness here uh, that really governs the tempo. Again, some sides could go, uh, not even get to go for multiple turns. That is possible, though unlikely, and the game really has to balance against that. Now, the nice thing is, there are so many turns in the game that you do have a lot of opportunity uh, to have that balance out a little bit. Um, and, and ultimately, again, it comes down to having the Austrian player really pushing uh, the Prussian player, uh, and, and likewise, the Prussians trying to stay alive long enough to delay uh, the Austrian advances. And that's really how the game sort of balances itself out. Um, you do, in the winter turns, have an opportunity to build units out of your dead pile. But the general trend is, over the course of the game, armies will deplete, will deplete, will deplete. They'll be very exhausted. There are ways to get, you know, via the cards, units back on the board more quickly um, to sort of supplement that. But really, you're, you're going to be managing that. And, and all things told, that's really most of the game right there. Um, so uh, there's a couple other like minor details that I haven't covered here, but I think I've, I've already talked a lot, and, and the game system is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of craziness to it. It's straightforward. It's tense, I will say that much, um, in that you know you just don't know how well that fight, that battle's going to go. You're, you're hoping the siege that you're conducting is going to end quickly, but you're not sure. You never know when the Russians are going to do what they need to do, even though the Russians are one of your best, you know, uh, stacks of units in the game. And even when the Russians switch sides, it's not like the Russians are going to move, be moving very quickly for the Prussians either, and those last so many turns of the game can be very critical in terms of edging out uh, a victory. And so, um, you know, it, 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 it works for what it's doing. It does not include anything related to the North American or Indian theaters of the Seven Years' War, it is couched very much uh, on everything you see here, the sort of German Central Europe front uh, between Prussia and Austria. So while other games may include in some fashion some element covering uh, the French and Indian War in North America uh, or the, uh, the conflicts in India between Britain and France, this game is really more of a Prussia versus Austria thing with their allies involved here. And I think it works for that. It doesn't need, uh, you know, extra mechanics that don't add a whole lot. It is really focused on 
the European uh, theaters and, and how those are fought. Um, and I'll say uh, there's plenty of interesting conundrums to solve when you're playing the game. Uh, I did write a strategy article uh, for Board Game Geeks. If you go out to the Board Game Geek page and you look at the strategy forum, uh, you should find my, my post. I put some pointers for each side that I think is useful reading for folks looking to play the game. Um, I did find that I could win the game as either side. Um, some people are worried that Austria is overpowered. Um, I think that is really probably the result of maybe the Russians getting to activate a lot more, being very lucky with the Russians. But at the same time, um, I mean, I, I use the Prussian capabilities to run circles around the Austrians too. So, I mean, I, I've won handedly as both sides. I can see what their strengths and their weaknesses are. I, I'd say the game, you know, again, that, that luck factor could have maybe an over impactful uh, factor on the game, but I, I think it works because you're playing so many turns, so many chit draws, that you're going to get a nice mixture. So, so the, when it all averages out, I think the luck is probably fine, and you can certainly catch your opponent off guard. Um, you can capitalize on luck. You can foul up on your luck. You cannot seize, seize a really good opportunity that could happen. Um, and it's up to the players to be playing well to, to still win the game, it feels like. So, yeah, that's an overview of the game mechanics. Uh, I realize that's kind of long. There's probably a lot of content here. Um, we're going to go ahead and kick it to uh, uh, the end of the video where we're going to talk about my final thoughts and how I consider this game. Okay, so what did I think of the game? Um, well, I can tell you I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I was even going to. Um, the game is, you know, way better uh, than I was probably going to give it credit for early on. Um, having gotten to play both sides, really appreciating the nuance, uh, I'd say this is a pretty good game. In terms of, like, a letter rating or something, I mean, you know, B+, plus, I don't know, 8.5, something like that. Definitely um, worth worth the time and money for the experience, I think. Now, I'll say, uh, it might not be a game for everybody. So if you're looking at, like, I don't want to spend, I forget exactly how much it is, I mean, it, it's like 60 bucks or something like that, maybe, maybe more, for what is essentially a magazine game, I could understand why you wouldn't want to go for that. I, I will say the components are so good uh, and so nice, and it's, it's just a, such a pretty game that it, that that's kind of that kind of makes it worth it. Um, in terms of gameplay, I do think it, it's uh, pretty fun. Um, I think the cards add a, a nice element to the game, where you're not just managing the board position, but you have a reason to go after the minor forts. Like there is there is definitely a game reason to do that. You have an incentive to bring your opponent to combat. Um, to manage your sort of card economy to ensure uh, that you're, you know, making progress in the war, that you're, you're seizing territory, even if it's not a resource fort, which governs whether or not you win the game. Um, so, I, you know, the, the thing about games on the Seven Years' War, I feel like it, so much of it has to really feel like um, Freddy, <laughs> Frederick is, you know, hopping all over the place, uh, uh, sort of, you know, fighting a defensive war, um, and getting just just the nail-biter finish, right? Because the history um, plays into that, right? You, you have the Russian steamroller coming. You have to manage that. You have to figure out how you're going to deal with that. Um, the game incentivizes you to still operate the, the Kleine Krieg. So, so there's a whole element of... Um, the light infantry and, and scouting and different operations that were a part of the war, the game doesn't have a whole lot of special mechanics governing that like other games, like Clash of Monarchs does. But <clears throat> there are certainly instances where spending an odd point here to move one unit uh, to sort of seize some minor territory and clear supply paths um, is valuable. And, and I found the more I played the game, more I found that very important to send, again, one unit down here just to take a space over here because 
later I might need that supply line opened up to uh, dash down and attack my opponent's resource or cut him off um, or bring him to battle and he didn't know I was going to go that far. Um, your, you know, all the critical theaters of like Silesia feel uh, uh, feel right, I guess, for the history, even if it, again, this is more of a simplified view uh, of the war. Um, you definitely have, like, it, the history feels right, and I think that's an important piece. Even it, even being a simpler game, it still mostly feels right. Um, I mean, you know, you can have the French, which are, you know, pretty large armies, um, coming up here to harass the British, but the British have the capability to fend them off like they did historically. Um, the French still have a chance. You can still make something with the French, ha have, have something happen over here, but the British have the capability to, to do as well as they did and sort of push the French out. Uh, the Austrians have good leaders that can fight the Prussians, but um, it's going to be sometimes uh, a, a tough thing, and you really have to hope that the Russians are, are causing enough of, of a distraction to make progress. Even the Swedes have an important role to play, just being that extra front that the Prussian player has to pay attention to. Um, and, and you as the Prussians have an interest in trying to shut down that theater um, as early as you can, and, and there are ways for that to occur. So I, I think from a historical narrative standpoint, the game matches that. It does a good enough job for it, even without a lot of extra chrome. It manages to do uh, pretty good, pretty good there. Um, again, the luck can be a frustrating factor. Um, a lot can be, you know, you didn't roll enough action points, or you pulled the chit that meant you didn't get to go this turn, or you just can't seem to hit for crap on a fort. That kind of stuff can happen. Um, and, and I can definitely feel for anybody who are looking at the game and saying, the, the luck factor is screwing up my game. But I think it still balances out. The nice thing is you can play this, I think, across several hours. So it's not going to be an all-day affair. It might still take a while, depending on how fast you're playing the game. But, you know, if, if you're really having a rough time, maybe you can, you can start over and, and try again or switch sides or whatever, and it's not so bad. Um, definitely, uh, at least, a, a, you're probably going to go over three or four hours, I would suspect, um, until you get really, really fast with the game, and then maybe it'll be faster. But... Um, there's definitely, you know, because of all the die rolling, that's going to take some time. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm walking away from this game glad that I bought it. Uh, it has a place on my shelf. It is my later Seven Years War game until maybe something else comes out. I don't know. I know the No Peace Without Spain system is maybe getting a rendition of the Seven Years War. But um, this feels right. This feels good for what it is. Um, you know, it's not Clash of Monarchs. It's not trying to be. It is its own lighter treatment of the topic, uh, but it is fun. It is tense, and, you know, every turn you're, you're biting your nails, figuring out where can I go, or, you know, do I go on the attack, or do I try to rally my troops who've been disordered from the last major combat. All of those things are interesting choices, um, and it threads the needle where you don't have a huge amount of analysis paralysis, uh, so, you know, you, what you should be trying to do is usually clear, but it's not like there's ever like, oh, this is the absolute easiest, best thing to do in every situation. You gotta play, you know, play play the situation and figure out what you want to do, how much risk you want to take on. I think all of that's important to a good war game. Um, and and so uh, when it comes to this, uh, the Great Crisis of Frederick II, um, I I'm giving it a thumbs up. I think it's a good game. I think it's worth your time. If you're interested in the topic, obviously, if you're not into Seven Years War, then you know, maybe there's another game that you'd be interested in instead. Um, but yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it, guys. I liked it, and it took me a long time to do this video. Uh, a lot to do with my table space and the overall situation, but I had to make sure that once I got to playing this game, you know, the games that I played, the three or four that I played, were really a couple months ago, and I wanted to let the game stew in my mind even a little bit and say, well, can I reflect back on those game experiences and, and were they good experiences or were they just so fresh in my mind that I'm predisposed, you know, have a, a disposition to say it's a good game because I just played it. I let it sit for a while and as I look at the map, I'm, I'm remembering some fun situations and, and uh, how the game went and the challenging areas and, oh, that's a critical point over there. I, I can look back at my game experience and say it's 
it was a positive one, which I think is a good thing. I can look at this game after the fact, respect the good time I had with it, and recommend it to you. So, uh, VUCA Simulations, they did a great job with this one. Components, great. Gameplay, uh, quite good and enjoyable. I'm interested to see what else they do. The production quality is so great that, I mean, gosh, you know, I'd probably be wowed by anything at this point, but um, really good stuff. Uh, again, um, they, they took a game that was a magazine game that looked okay, and they made it a beautiful production, uh, enjoyable, and all-around good stuff. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was uh, helpful to you if you're thinking about getting the game or you're, you're unsure or you wanted to see it a little more closely. Um, I've not done any playthroughs of this one. Um, I mean, you could play it uh, solo because of the chip pool, but the cards kind of make it a little bit harder to solo for that reason because, you know, the whammy cards you're going to get, I'm going to hit you with this card. So probably not one that's, that I would like to solo on camera. Um, but, it, you know, it's still a good game. I did all that gameplay off camera, so you'll have to trust me on that one. Um, but, yeah, hope you enjoyed, guys. We'll uh, see you in the next one, I guess. Take care. Keep on gaming.